Okay, welcome everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Paolo Cuccarelli. I'm funding director of the Center for Design and coordinator of the conversation series that we actually run monthly. Uh, it's two years now and um, that we try to uh, discuss uh, intersections between design and other disciplines for research purposes. And you can see uh, on the screen some of the previous and bridges, as we call them, that we tried to open and, and build and facilitate uh, for interdisciplinary research. And that's actually the mission of the Center for Design. And is this is the second uh, installment of the fall series. The first one was on data sonification. We started to experiment also other formats. Uh, so we were abroad. Uh, we did a a uh, different event it was a panel plus a live performance on a cultural center and it was back in person so actually we realized that this is the first time that we are running this series of events in person and in the center within the center for design that's really the first time and we experienced some problems here with mm -hmm. the setting but um today we discuss about what uh putting the patient at the center of healthcare services means and uh, what might be the role of design when intersect with other disciplines in that. Uh, we have an amazing lineup of speakers and panelists. So without further ado, I leave the stage to the moderators and the curator of this uh, conversation, uh, Ms. Kim and Michael Majors. The floor is yours. I'm going to share my... Oh. <laughs> okay, can you see my screen? Yeah, we can. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you for joining our roundtable session to discuss the disciplinary meanings of patient-centeredness. I will start by briefly sharing some context of this study and findings. Thank you. <laughs> and findings uh, from our preliminary research. Okay. okay, right, there we go. So this project, Empowering Patientship, aims to study the meanings and patterns of patient-centeredness. The project was originally initiated in 2017 by Polytechnic at Politecnico di Milano. The goal was to build a theoretical framework and a structured methodology in order to identify, map, and systematize innovative product service systems that illustrate the patient-centric transformation in Italy. Since 2022, a collaboration has begun with the Center for Design. And currently, the Milan and Boston teams are exploring the emerging role of patients and caregivers as user innovators within design processes by mapping and comparing patient-centered projects into regions. Um, in the context of this project in particular, uh, we try to analyze from a systematic liter literature review the many definitions of patient-centeredness, addressing the fundamental research question of what is patient-centeredness? Um, and we've collected in the, in the past couple of months uh, different definitions uh, through a, an intensive literature review, and at the same time in parallel collected real world cases, meaning that we've been exploring both in uh, Milan, in Italy, and in Boston, many different projects that claim to be patient-centered somehow, and we've been exploring that in the context of the Boston ecosystem to begin with. Um, um, some of the preliminary findings that, that, that we've gathered through this research is a, through the literature review, um, the many definitions of patient-centeredness and the values uh, that were distilled uh, from this analysis uh, has to do, for example, the top ones to listening to patients and their families, uh, reliance on patient perspective perspectives and patient engagement, power sharing, and empowering patients to make informed decisions, for example, and coordination and collaboration between providers, among others, as you can see. Um, at the same time, the definitions that we distilled and the values that we distilled from the cases that we analyzed in, in, in the ecosystem 
we had identified similarly the early detection and minimizing preventable harm, for example, coordination and collaboration between providers, which we all also mentioned in this in the still from the literature review, personalized or customized care, empowering patients to make informed decisions, um, real-time communication reporting was a good one. Um, including patients and their support systems, like their families, for example, and patient engagement, uh, are in the in the top top ranked. So the idea behind this project and why we wanted to start this conversation today was basically to discuss among the different stakeholders here uh, in the working in the industry and in academia. Um, to try to understand their perspectives and their takes on patient centeredness in the context of their work and their disciplines and how they are applying the concepts in the many different projects that they're working on. Um, and this is just the, the beginning of the conversation. We'll have a second series in which we're gonna uh, incorporate the perspectives from the patients themselves and patient advocacy groups. Um, so just to share a couple of examples of the cases that I was referring to earlier, uh, we have this uh, top and say I, for example, is, is a relevant case in which they describe how uh, the value of listening to patients and or their families are uh, high ranked and they utilize this as the core of their project. Um, this is another example, it's called iHealth Space. And basically they have a holistic understanding uh, of the patients and they have a continuous care system that coordinates between patients, family and their providers. Um, and we hope to uh, incorporate all these cases and all the mapping that we're doing in both the Milano and Italy ecosystem and the Boston ecosystem to provide a broader overview of how the healthcare system in both uh, areas or regions are approaching patient-centeredness, patient are approaching healthcare in a way that is more inclusive and including patients in co-designing their solutions. However, we are in the process of creating the maps of these cases. If you are interested, here is the URL for the web page. I will also paste the URL in the chatting window of the Zoom. So thank you. This was a quick introduction of our project to enrich our discussion. We will now move into the round table discussion with our panels. And let me start that by introducing our panels really briefly. So I'm going to do that alphabetically. So Don, okay. So Don is assistant professor of applied psychology at Northeastern University. Thank you for coming. And we have uh, Jason. Jason is the founder and CEO of Jack Rabbit Learning Experience. Thank you for joining us. We have Jen. So Jen is the Chief Design Strategy Officer at Medco. Thank you for coming. Leanne. <laughs> so Leanne is Associate Professor of Physical Therapy and she's also leading the Regain XR Lab at Northeastern University. Thank you. We have oh uh, Saiki no okay oh Saiki you're there you're a panel we are running out of chair <laughs> so we have a Saiki associate professor of creativity and creative practice PMD at Northeastern University we have uh, Robert Reinman so director of experience design at Dana Health thank you so much for coming during the round <laughs> <laughs> we have the roundness. We have Greg joined here as well. So he's the vice president and of uh, client experience and strategy at Medco. Thank you. And lastly, we have Stefano, Stefano Maffei, who professor. Yep. Yeah. Yep, Stefano. Yep. So he's uh, like a, a full professor in the design department at Politecnico di Milano. So I introduced everybody, right? Great. Cool. So now I'm going to pass the ball to Michael, who will facilitate the conversation today. Great. Well, we'd like to just start with the uh, thank. Thank you so much, Miso, for uh, for covering uh, all that material and um, sharing our research with you all. 
Um, thank you, Paolo, for hosting this uh, uh, great panel. And thank you, everybody, all the panelists for, uh, for coming today. Um, you know, we'd like to just start off with kind of a, uh, a easy, uh, well, I hope it's an easy question, but it can be a, a bit complicated too. Um, the question of you, if you could just introduce what is patient centeredness from your perspective, from your field, um, uh, and 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 we'll get that started. Um, maybe maybe we can start off with Jason and then just move down the uh, move down the table. Sounds good. So for some context, all of the work that we do. I was ready to go. We, <laughs> ready? All right. So for some context, all of the work that I'm involved with and all the work that we do at Jackrabbit is is all around um, education and learning. So that's important in the context of what I'm going to say. So uh, for us, patient-centeredness is really about of course, understanding the patient, the people around them, their supports, their caregivers, understanding the systems around them, understanding the goals of those systems, the KPIs of those organizations, um, and of course, understanding learning sciences, behavior sciences, and and other um, other bodies of research that are relevant to whatever is being designed. I'm a very practical person though. And when we design, we have a very specific way of thinking about patient-centeredness. We take all of our research inputs and we actually create custom design tools that are, are used by every practitioner at every step throughout an entire project to create something, which means that you know, if we are looking at hundreds or thousands of data points, things to keep track of, that's really impossible for any individual person to do for the life of the project. So we want to create tools that that kind of simplify and distill those things into tools that are used through initial design and prototyping and testing and iteration and then scale. And the scale part is where it gets really tricky. Sometimes things can break down. So um, patient-centeredness in a practical sense for us is really about making sure that those elements are really baked in and that we can look at the final product and very easily backtrack to understand how the final product connects with the research that we started with. That's, That's great. great. Thank you, Jason. Uh, keeping, keeping keeping the entire value, value chain connected and informed all the way through is uh, uh, hugely, hugely important. important. Um, I think we're going to skip Polo as our host uh, for, 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 for the, the uh, for the for the event, event. but uh, we'll, we'll move to the end. Professor, Professor here at Northeastern. Northeastern. Thank you. Thank you. So my research is um, more. I'm a neuroscientist by training, and I'm in a physical therapy department, so we do a lot of assessment and intervention, and we're building tools, but they're a very early stage. And so when I started as a researcher, this idea of patient-centeredness wasn't so much of a thing, and what we did was, was truly terrible. You know, the, the people would sit in the lab, and they'd think about what should be done and what these people need, <laughs> and then, um, and this still, this still happens, I'm sad to say. So the National Institutes of Health, you know, tend to fund research that is gestated in a lab and goes through a very rigorous series of clinical trials. And stakeholders are generally not involved. Patients themselves are generally not involved until a very late stage where you've already invested millions of dollars. You've done a lot of work to demonstrate feasibility and pilot or better efficacy, maybe even in a placebo-controlled trial of a thing that may or may not have real world impact usability for the group that's targeted. And so when I think of this really important work in the workshop you're doing, it's that these, these considerations really need to percolate back to these very early um, ideas and changing the way that we think about basic research and needs and how we decide the, the work that we, the, the questions that we engage from the get-go. Um, and so this is the work that we're hoping to do. Um, one of the students on this project, Ori Seitz, I'm really thrilled that he is a PhD student in the Interdisciplinary Design and Media Program hosted by both Miso and I. And so in, this is work that I'm hoping he brings this perspective to our lab, working with um, young autistic individuals and their families who are um, non-speaking. So this is, this is, 
one one direction. Um, we've been working also with games and games actually is pretty easy to get a lot of stakeholders who care about games to be involved. So, so that's the other direction, but it's it's slow, admittedly. Um, but I, I'm, I'm lauding your work and I'm excited to see where it goes and how we can pull it in the earlier direction. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so much, Leanne. Leanne and only, only the, the second, second panelist, panelist and already we see some, some uh, similar themes emerging here. Um, Robert, uh, also, uh, uh, is, there, is, there is there a thoroughgoing, thoroughgoing connection, connection that, uh, that, that you're maintaining, maintaining in, in your work as well? well? Um, let me get my notes up. Sorry, folks. Um, so you mentioned that patient-centeredness can be complicated. And that's because our healthcare system is complicated. And uh, so I work, I, I direct user experience uh, for a part of um, Athena Health. Athena Health, for people who aren't familiar, is a, uh, uh, is a system that, uh, that is is a ECR and revenue cycle management system, uh, and so it covers uh, patient experience through things like self scheduling, self payment plan, self check in, uh, uh, patient portal messaging, and patient engagement. It covers uh, the clinical chart um, and uh, and clinical encounters, um, so the clinical provider and staff experience. Um, and then it also covers the revenue cycle, uh, which is scheduling, check-in, check-out, authorizations, and billing. And it has to do this at scale. So Athena Health uh, has over 120,000 providers as part of our network. Uh, approximately 10% of patients in the United States uh, are going to providers who use Athena Health. So we have to solve problems not just at the individual level. We have to solve problems across the entire health network. And... Uh, the healthcare system in the United States is complicated and it's broken. Um, uh, unlike in Italy, where there is a single payer system that makes things a bit more straightforward, here in the United States we have sometimes, a. Let's say sometimes. <laughs> uh, fair enough. Um, here in the United States, we have a complex uh, private payer system where where each provider has different rules and different. Uh, 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 expectations uh, that practices, uh, you know, without our help are, are basically, you know, uh, buried in trying to figure out. Uh, so, uh, so like I said, we have to do this at scale. And so, uh, so, you know, unsurprisingly, the patient has to be at the center of our thinking about how this is, but there's, a, it's expanding ripples. We have the patient at the center. Outside of that, we have the providers and their needs. Outside of that, we have uh, uh, billing problems and interacting with then federal regulations, which are constantly changing, and uh, private payer uh, policies, which are also constantly changing. Uh, so this is the, this is the world that we live in, and it's a very imperfect world. And so we try and make the best of it. So we try and help empower patients to navigate both their care and the payment of that care. And that payment of the care is important because of patients. Uh, don't know how to pay for it, they're not going to go to the doctor and they're not going to get the care that they need. Uh, so we try and make that more clear and transparent so that they can make informed choices and work with their provider. We help the providers engage and connect with patients and help them uh, get, the, get the patients the care they most need. Over half of our uh, practices that our subscribers are small practices. Many of them are in rural areas with at-risk populations. And so, you know, we are helping those providers engage better with patients and get them in. Um, while at the same time, navigating all of those regulatory and payer requirements. And then we help the admin staff get the information they need from payers and providers and, uh, uh, and, and patients, payers, providers, and patients to ensure that the patient care isn't delayed or disrupted because of eligibility problems or other payer-related issues, to maximize the insurance payments so that the practice can stay afloat and that the financial uh, footprint for the patient is minimized so that they are not paying the majority of it, and uh, to maximize the, uh, the admin effort uh, so, or, or minimize the effort that the administrative staff has to go through to accomplish all of that so that they can focus more on the patients and less on making the payers and the government happy. 
Um, and right now, in, at this particular point in time, medical practices in the U.S. are overwhelmed. They are coming out of the uh, they're they're coming out of the pandemic, understaffed. Um, you know, trying to find qualified people. At the same time, patients are less and less willing to come into the practice or to schedule appointments, which means that their healthcare is potentially suffering. Um, and it also means that practices are not getting the revenue that they need to stay afloat. So it's a very challenging time. So anything we can do to help uh, practices better engage with patients, get patients more engaged by communicating with, with them on behalf of the practices, and of course, deal with all of the you know payer and government red tape that practices have to deal with is uh, all part of being patient centered. Uh, and so it's not just about patients; it's about the entire healthcare system. Thanks, 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 thanks so much, so much Robert. Robert. That uh, just, just it broadened, it broadened my, my perspective, perspective a little bit because you, you know normally, normally I think we think, think about, about patient centered. centered uh, experiences as being, being primarily in the clinician's, clinician's office. office. Uh, maybe, maybe even, even if, we if we extend it out, out to the, uh, the reception uh, area, reception or, area or, um, you know, what are those, what are those spaces, spaces in, in emer emergent care? Uh, and do they, do they guide, guide the, the, the participant to, to the proper space, space that they're going to? Uh, but even thinking about the billing system and uh, how patients make payments, how they're interacting with their health insurance, uh, as a proxy to their medical care experience. Um, these are really, you know, it's a really a broad view of, of what patient-centered, uh, the scope of patient-centered in, in the U.S. Uh, can be. Um, thanks so much. Um, All right, let me know if, if people can, we're getting a thumbs up? All right, excellent. Um, so my name is Don Robna. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Applied Psychology here at Northeastern, and my background is in clinical psychology. So a lot of the background that I'm coming from is more just in the office working with patients, um, primarily like in an outpatient context. And so I'll think a little bit about um, kind of what patient-centeredness looks like in that context, and then maybe how we can um, move towards it more. So to provide a little bit of context, a lot of the work uh, that's done in clinical psychology and psychiatry is kind of rooted in this framework of having symptom-based diagnosis and treatment protocols. So for example, if someone comes into the clinic and is describing having intrusive thoughts uh, following a trauma and they're reporting a high level of avoidance and lots of hypervigilance, they would probably receive a diagnosis of PTSD and that would let the, the clinician know what the appropriate treatment protocol is. And so they would kind of get paired up with either prolonged exposure therapy or cognitive processing therapy. And then once that treatment has been selected, the main goal of treatment is symptom reduction, getting to the point where the person is no longer experiencing PTSD symptoms in an intrusive and distressing way. And when this is not working well, you can almost go through the entire process without the patient really having any clear understanding of what they're doing there or how they're knowing if they're progressing in the way that they should be. And so it can be a really limiting framework. And much as Leanne was describing, a lot of this developed with almost no in, you know, input from patients as to whether this is really the system that they wanted. And so in recent years, there's been much more of a push to make things more patient-centered. And there's a variety of ways in which that can um, take place. And some of the big ways in which it takes place are in having people more involved in each step of this process. So really in a fundamental way, a big part of it is about thinking about the outcomes people want from therapy. A lot of people don't come in thinking, you know, my goal here is symptom reduction. They come in thinking, I want to be able to go to work and focus at work, or I want to be able to be with my kids and not feel like I'm, you know, irritable and distracted. And so it's really about orienting the outcomes in a way that makes sense for the patient. And then a big part of it is also empowering the patient to, to have the knowledge about the treatment choices they're making. So rather than just assigning a specific treatment, working with the patient to say what treatment is best for you. And then finally, I think even more recently, there's been a real push to try and help people personalize treatments, recognizing that each individual is unique and that they're not just this homogeneous diagnosis. And in that context, really allowing the treatment to be tailored to the specific individual. But I really appreciated hearing Robert's comments because I think a lot of the work that's done in this area is bound by the healthcare system in which we exist. You know, patient-centeredness requires time and it requires attention and those things only happen when the healthcare system allows it. Um, but I think that these are valuable steps and 
you know, there's a lot of room to continue moving forward. So a kind of uh, outcomes oriented perspective uh, rather than goals oriented is really key for your perspective on patient centeredness yeah. here is what I'm is, is some of what I'm hearing Don. Yeah, uh, yeah thank you. Um, Stefano, thank you very we, much. Yes. So it's my turn. The goal is yours. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I think I could bring in a slightly different different perspective. That's because as, as Miso and Michael was introducing before, we are partnering in this research that is about this exploration of the concept of patient centers through cases and exploration of the actors that are involved in the process. Uh, I'm the director of a makerspace. So uh, my first take on this topic was through materiality because I didn't know the, the word materiality. We worked a lot because we were developing, uh, starting from the research process, in which we were collaborating with a um, great uh, pharma enterprise was Sanofi, has helped us in mapping out these cases of uh, patient innovation connected to rare diseases because they work in rare disease area. And through that, we, we approached the, 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 the processes of finding solution for people that are not listened to in the market. Because as you know, uh, rare disease are small batches of patients, so they are not interesting for anybody, not for the National Healthcare Service, nor for enterprises. So it's a quite strange world in which this idea of having needs is not listened. So we started from them with the, say, the inquiry, and we start working with them in the process. So we were trying to use the idea of listening not only to the needs, but to their creativity, because they don't have only experiences. They have also capabilities. It's not just uh, being able to listen with protocols. It's just to let them participate with equal power throughout the process, not just in the inquiry phase, but all throughout the phases. And the final thing is uh, helping them in, in uh, transforming these the say prototypes, because we did prototypes, real prototypes. That is another question, in my opinion, is about language, how we speak with them, how we introduce the fact that they are not experts, but they have experiences of, of capabilities that are worth to listen to. So in my opinion, this is another important uh, uh, um, issue. So starting from this, we, we uh, were trying to help them in uh, put their innovation into the market. We'd analyze this, what we call make to care, because the name of the research was make it ladder, in which we analyze the steps that are needed for moving from a prototype to a real solution on the market. Because again, if we are doing only prototypes, it's not worth the effort. A lot, lot of money, a lot of time, and also a lot of mistrust. Because if another important thing that you understand throughout this process, that you are always considering them like in an extractive mode, you are taking from them. So this idea of balancing, and we were discussing before this idea of using the data with, uh, let's say, a more fair agreement, the idea of let them participating, having a role also in perhaps the possible entrepreneurial development, it could be a plus. The mediators of the things are not just the patient the individuals, are the patient association. So I think the one thing that we have to discuss in patient centeredness is the role of patient uh, representation through association or say in an official dialogue with public institution because there is a regulator, regulatory uh, barrier that you have to overcome only if you start negotiating from the beginning. So a lot of question, not <laughs> answer, sorry. <laughs> but I think that one final, just suggesting is how we could build together all these stakeholders safe space. It's not clearly on the market in the university, so it's just a kind, if I use the university words, it's just third mission space in which we could put together, say, entrepreneurialty and society together to build something that could be a win win solution. I stop here, just not to steal too much time. <laughs> I'm passing you. Uh Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Stefano. And I think you know this highlights an important role that academia has to play 
uh, you know, researching and developing these approaches to care that might not be immediately apparent in the marketplace how this might be viable or in a uh, in a policy context how this might work. Uh, these things can be tested in this uh, uh, sort of uh, academic environment that allows uh, allows them to be developed further and uh, uh, possibly used. Um, thanks so much. Um, let's uh, pass to so Jen. Uh, this is a very nice segue because you're you're involved directly in uh, producing many of these solutions for the marketplace. Yeah. Uh, um, are we good. Okay. Sound right. Let me know if it's not loud enough. Uh, actually, I really love where I ended up in this mix because I can kind of just be like, what all they they all said it, what they said. Um, but when I was reflecting on this question, there were actually kind of three bullets I, you know, wanted to bring to today, and all of them have already been highlighted. You know, the first was um, kind of what Jason was getting at around for us at MadPow. We we are effectively we're a design agency and consultancy. Um, we do a lot of experience, strategy, and design, and all of the adjacent kind of practitioner roles. Uh, with clients, a lot of it's in the healthcare space, although we do some outside of that. And it kind of spans that whole ecosystem. But for us, patient-centeredness often includes helping clients understand and see the business value, right? And so connecting the business chain or the value chain across that system, you know, I'd like to say there are more and more healthcare clients that understand like the philosophical and human value of patient-centeredness. But we are still doing some of that work and advocacy, but even for clients who already get it or that the humans get it, connecting it to the bottom line, because we are all still working in a capitalist system. And until that changes, being able to provide those safe spaces is one option. The other is show the business value. So that's bullet one really for us at MadPow. The second is, um, as we've heard a bit about, converting our... Um, assessment of patients in this system from recipients of or subjects of our work to not just participants, which I think is a baby step. And to be frank, that's kind of where we're at, but really become co-designers and, and maybe make them the drivers and designers. And we are really putting ourselves in more of a facilitative role. Um, and you can kind of wax philosophical about that, but certainly on the ground, more tactically, you have to kind of make compromises along the way. But for us, a lot of the work we're doing is helping our clients, again, understand how to bring that into the work and for us to advocate for it so that we aren't designing something in a cave or in a lab by ourselves, but with patients and others in the mix, driving or at least contributing to that design work. Um, but I'll come back to that too, because I think there's sort of a hang up that happens in the world for that. And then the third is that systems view um, that I was going to say, I'm starting to hear, and I'm sure you guys are too, especially in the academic world, more and more energy around systems thinking. And so for me personally, in my practice, and I think others in, at MadPow and in professional services, helping our clients who've already decided, yes, we need to be more patient-centered. Yes, we understand the business value. Yes, we care about the human value. Um, but they then take a very myopic view of the patient and, and where they zoom right in on the patient and then kind of lose sight of the fact that that patient's experience is very much influenced, if not mediated by a million other actors and objects in the system. So to really design and deliver patient-centered experiences, you really have to pay a lot of attention to things that aren't the patient. The other humans who are providing that experience, not just clinicians, but other staff and, and other roles, uh, as well as all the systems, objects, data, infrastructure, and so on. So those are kind of the three lenses that I think patient-centeredness takes for us. And, and the thing I was going to say earlier to bring it together is, especially with patient-centeredness, meaning really engaging patients as co-designers of their own lives, there's, there's, there's two things to that. One is the logistics. Like, how do you actually just achieve that? Like the channels by which it happens, certainly, um, you know, and the means by which you enable it. Sure, that's really hard and not really solved yet. But I think we get hung up on that a lot when actually the other piece to that is, you have to trust patients to do that. And I don't see that a lot yet. I think we still have a long way to go before humans really want to trust other humans to apply their own lived experience to this work. We've got a problem with expertise and hierarchy that I, th I think we still need to work on. So that's my read on the, the situation. Thanks, thanks so much. Uh, thanks so much, Jen. Um, yeah, like, like you said, there, there are a lot of, lot of similar things themes here, uh, power sharing. And uh, I, I think, you know, your role as facilitating those connections between uh, between patients and uh, uh, these kind of other systems that they interact with, I think is, you know, comes comes forward is really important. Um, 
as well as, you know, kind of this, this subtlety that you bring that where these patients aren't just the patient, you know, it's a, it's a very complex and uh, diverse group of people with a lot of, you know, a lot of different perspectives towards this and a lot of past experiences um, and knowledge that they bring to this interaction. So acknowledging like the expertise is not just in the physicians and the healthcare providers, but also expertise out in the, in the patient, uh, uh, patient realm. I think is is a really uh, nice insight. Uh, Psyche Louis, uh, shall we go to you? Uh, what what is patient centeredness in 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 your practice? Associate professor in music, also in um, psychology and neuroscience. Uh, and in my lab, we think about music based interventions. Right, so we work with music therapists um, to design patient-centered or participant-centered interventions uh, for different kinds of um, outcomes for cognitive and brain health. So we're also part of the Center for Cognitive and Brain Health here on, on the Northeastern campus. Um, and I think it's, it's quite interesting because music therapy has always been patient-centered in some ways. You think about Apollo, right, who famously played liars to folks to make them feel better, right? And so that's thousands of years ago. Um, fast forward to today, um, you can still, you, you get um, licensed in music therapy after you get 200 clinical hours working in a clinic with different special populations where you play music to them, right? And it, it's a one-on-one -on -one basis. You, you watch how people are reacting to the music you're making and you make your, you're playing faster or you make your playing slower based on how they're doing. So it, I think it doesn't really get any more patient-centered than that. Um, the problem is with, first of all, with scaling that up, right? There are just not enough music therapists to go around. Um, there are not enough training programs to go around. Um, and the second problem that maybe is related is to convince stakeholders that this is something that needs, you know, that, that needs more clinical support. Um, so that gets into different levels of evidence, right? NIH still thinks of the randomized controlled trial as like the gold standard level one evidence. Um, and it's very hard to convince stakeholders um, of the efficacy of a one-on-one -on -one intervention where, where everyone is doing something very different. Um, and so I think that's where some of what my lab does comes in. So we do neuroscience studies that look at the brain, look at the body, look at behavior uh, before and after these interventions. So we work with music therapists in the, um, a lot of them based in the Berkeley College of Music, where there's a, a music therapy program that trains a lot of interns. So the interns then come to our lab, uh, work with the uh, with participants. So one example is Parkinson's disease. Another example, we'll talk about that more, is um is Alzheimer's disease. Right. So we have people coming in who ha who are in early stages of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so we have these music therapy interns uh, come uh, work with these um, these um, patients, and we come up with playlists from the youth of um, of people in Alzheimer's disease uh, that's been shown to be effective at engaging their brains. Uh, and it turns out that self-selected music, right, listening to music that you chose to listen to yourself is much better at engaging your brain's reward system um, than music that we ask you to listen to, which is kind of obvious, um, but it's also, you, you, you think about what's being reviewed at the National Institute of Health right now, and you, know, you get these um, kind of funny um, applications for you know, millions of dollars of research funding asking um, to play Mozart and Haydn um, to a community, to, to a largely black and Hispanic sample of, of participants, you know, without particularly knowing what music that they, they might, like, might like to listen to in the first place. So, so this at least kind of um, puts an end to that <laughs> line of thinking. Um, and so I think part of what being patient-centered means is like listening <laughs> to what your participants um, have to say, um, coming up with um, individual individualized knowledge um, of what makes their reward systems work the best. Uh, and then hope, hopefully designing studies that go through the different stages of clinical interventions um, so that you start at the feasibility level uh, with knowledge of um, individual needs and then scale up from you know, that first, clin first phase one clinical trial, phase two clinical trial, phase three clinical trials. I think that the patient centeredness needs to come in even at the very first level. So I think I'll stop there. Well, well it sounds like, like it sounds like collaboration is is a really big part of this process and engaging with all these other disciplines 
um, uh, is, is really key to how patient-centeredness manifests itself with music therapy. Um, where do you where do you see since since you still have the bowl, um, uh, 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 you know, like where where do you see uh, where do you see like collaborations that might be enhanced? Uh, uh, where's where's like kind of under underutilized uh, capacities within the within the healthcare field to uh, to offer better care? For um a lot of space for developing systems that can flexibly engage with individual participants' needs and interests. Um, so in the field of music, we all know we have different interests in music, right? I listen to something that's maybe a bit different from what you listen to. Um, and what we started to do is, uh, and I think it's really, I'm very excited about this. What we've started to do is work with theoretical neuroscientists that come up with um, flexible systems that can take um, any individual choices and detect um, signal changes from those choices. So the signal I'm interested in is music. Uh, music across different cultures has rhythm, uh, it has pitch. And so what th these, uh, we have collaborators that develop neural network models that can extract the rhythm from any flexible music that's being played, right? So regardless of whether you're playing Adele or Mozart or you know, hip hop, um, it can extract the rhythm and change lights, for example, uh, in time to it. So, so there's a lot of design that goes into that. Um, but what we can do then is use that as a system to flexibly um, engage the brain um, during a, a music listening session. So I think of that as one way to, um, to incorporate patient centeredness and individual choices um, in a flexible and scalable manner. So we're, we're testing that in uh, in clinical trials right now. So Robert was talking about feedback earlier, and uh, you know this this uh, you know the patient's experience cycled through the billing uh, cycle might be a kind of a long loop of feedback, but this is a really tight loop that uh, that you're seeing almost instantaneously happen, um, uh, and and then being able to visualize that, um, yeah, yeah. Um, Jen, do you uh, do you do you see any kind of uh, uh, just with the mechanics of, of of how this is working right now? Um, uh, uh, yeah, maybe we go this way again. Um, uh, do you, do you also see some capacity, maybe some un untapped potential for collaboration in your field? I do. I think. Um, are we good? Okay, I'll wait. I always watch for the green. Um, <laughs> I, in fact, I, in sort of answer to that second question and thinking in advance about it, I mean, really, uh, and I like the answer here feeds right into it is getting everybody to think a little bit more in terms of systems and thinking about themselves as a node in the network rather than the top or middle or center point of a system, uh, whether it's the patient or themselves as the deliverer of something, care, product, service. And I think for us in particular, especially being an organization full of, of design practitioners and related types of craft, uh, a lot of that is getting everybody to think a little bit more like a systems thinker. You know, I mentioned earlier, but when I think about collaboration, it's what can designers who are, you know, either in the field or literally in commercial spaces like Mad Pals designers, wh what would it take to get them to be collaborating more with academic institutions, some of the safe places for us to explore and fail where capitalism won't let us, um, or even with folks that are in clinical areas, what does it take to get more actual collaboration that isn't just at a conference or on a project with a client who's already engaged enough to want to pay for the service. And I, I think often about that. I sometimes keeps me up at night, but I think that's where there's a lot of potential for at least coming from our side, from practitioners in professional services. How do we get them to be more closely linked with folks who are already thinking about this, but doing it in a way that sometimes feels like it's not grounded in our practice. Um, and the other part of that that kind of feeds into it is that I think we definitely, and you probably all are hearing the same, right? The world is kind of getting more comfortable with moving away from a, a very command and control, predict and, and control kind of way of working and, and embracing, uh, embracing more emergent ways of working, you know, sense and respond instead of try to predict and control. And, and we feel very comfortable with that, but our clients don't. So being able to kind of marry those two together, I think there's a lot of a role for us to play to bring in the expertise. I put the, like capital E on that. It comes from clinicians, from academic institutions that bring a perceived, if not real rigor that, you know, is always there for everything we do. So it's not really an answer so much as just, I've been thinking about what does it take to get 
designers working in professional services with academic institutions and maker spaces and actual practicing clinicians to have a place to be interacting more that isn't just supported by you know dollars flowing back and forth but that's for all of us to figure out i guess <laughs> I think having, having come from professional practice myself, I think one of the most fun activities is convincing the clients uh, to spend money on things that they don't think are quite in their interest uh, at the at the outset. But you're in the wrong profession, so. <laughs> um, Paolo, uh, 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 sorry, 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 Stefano. Uh, I, I, I... <laughs> yes, it's good. Cool. Okay. I, I try to make some proposal because listening to all of you, there were a lot of things super interesting in my opinion that could be done. But listening to Jen, my, my uh, idea was why don't we build a kind of interdisciplinary experimental sandbox? So it's a kind of meta space in which we could put together different experiences that could be coming from professional experience, academia, entrepreneurship, public institution, just to test things in a, again, safe space, but safe for the experimenter and also for the patient or the patient association. It's a kind of virtual space. It perhaps could also put together facility. So there is not the need to invest in things just because university or professional services already these things. So it builds just a network. And linked to that is, is more uh, a discussion about what we are discussing here, because I think that we have a kind of um, misunderstanding, in my opinion, about perhaps we are discussing the cure process, and I'm more interested in the care process. So I think that we have to expand a little bit our discussion, because it means, in my opinion, that uh, with the due comparison between the US system and the Italian one, I think that the, what is really impacting in patient life sometimes is the care process, not just the, the cure, okay? So is this, let's say, uh, let's say patient journey every day with symptoms that perhaps are the most threatening thing in your daily life, in which you could have, let's say, something that goes out from the real healthcare, it goes in another dimension, it, it, in my opinion, also a huge space for design intervention, but interdisciplinary intervention. It, it doesn't need randomized control trials, but a more, again, collaborative and qualitative perception of what is good or not. So I think that also this could be also a, a slight revision of what, which is our focus and largely because there is a blurred data that we have to explore. But this, in my opinion, super interesting also for the business. It's not just for the patients, okay? And finally, last thing is, I think that we have to connect because I'm interested in it, so, sorry, <laughs> the design for policy approach, because I don't think that we could do really impactful intervention without connecting, especially in, on the public side, design for services without design for policy approach, because they are linked, close linked, because in, investing in, in public healthcare needs a discussion a continuous back and forth with the policy level. You could not do the, this only from the entrepreneurial perspective. Also because remembering Mariana Mantucato, all the thing that we are working on comes from state investment, knowledge, infrastructure and everything. So we could not consider that, but the fact is we, we are not able to really make impacts. So I think that we have to yeah. reintegrate in the discussion all yeah. this part. This, let's say, top level, but it's needed for. Since the bowl is close to me, can I interject? <laughs> a, a yes, and because I really like. Please jump he in. used the word interdisciplinary a few times, right? And I can't help. This was going through my brain earlier, but didn't have a uh, couldn't articulate it well. A, a colleague of mine likes to make this point, and I'm going to make it here. I like interdisciplinary is what we need, but also what would it mean to push? further and get into say what is transdisciplinary or maybe just post disciplinary dare I say it like what would that mean <laughs> and I think in an academic space we're so used to playing with that and then you get out into the quote real world and suddenly everyone's got to fall back into their lanes so something like you've just described and I watched him write it in his sketchbook and I was like yes mm -hmm. um, I think that's really the that's the idea right what does post disciplinary look like in actual execution and in, in, in the actual craft and that we engage in so that's all 
Well, and you know, I think what this uh, what this conversation brings out is the stakes are really quite high for experimentation in this field. Um, you know, when if we're selling taco chips or uh, you know t-shirts or you know UGG boots, you know, we're that that kind of commodity marketing. You know, if we if we don't do so well on on marketing that product or you know effectively communicating information, you know, it well we sell a few less UGG boots and and we'll be okay with that. Uh, but in healthcare, really these, uh, you know, this question of the process of care versus cure, um, I don't know, sometimes, you know, I'd, I'd pick cure if the, if the process was a little less, uh, 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 pleasant, um, uh, so, so, so where, where, where does that, you know, I think, I think it becomes really difficult to say, where is that line, um, or that fuzzy area, as you said, Stefano, uh, where's that fuzzy area, and what are the, what's the domain of that fuzzy area, um, when we think about uh, centering the patient, and uh, providing an excellent experience, as well as an excellent care, uh, and cure. <laughs> Take a look to the last IDO video, in which they say this intervene first after that they, I think, uh, make the statement of in the intervening end of pipe. So it's moving from finding solution to prevention. This is, in my opinion, this is the meaning, the most interesting meaning of the, the, the word blurred and care to cure. Okay, because you could anticipate building behavior. You could anticipate building, let's say, distributed models, not just targeted. So there's a huge op field of option in that. And I think that all the people here could really give a contribution. So. Don? Um, it's been really wonderful to hear all of these thoughts and, and to think about how they would apply in, in the kinds of uh, work that I do. And then there's a few things maybe that I just want to kind of pick up on that people have put on the table that I think are especially important. One is this, the idea of systems thinking. I think this is really crucial in a context of thinking about mental health. Um, as we've heard, it's, these are not just simply biological phenomena. They're biological and psychological and social and environmental. All of these different factors play a critical role in mental health. And so I think in thinking about patient-centeredness, part of what we can do is work with patients to help them see that broader system so that it's not simply receiving a diagnosis and a simple label, but actually understanding the system that for that individual is driving their distress. Now, again, that's a time consuming thing. That's a much, much harder task than just going through a checklist and assigning a diagnosis. And so I think one of the challenging things we have to think about is how we can actually accomplish some meaningful sense of what this system looks like and the different points in which we can support people by intervening on the system. But I think another thing that it makes me think of is, is this idea of, of care and, and I'll say prevention. One of the things that's true of systems is that once they've fallen into like a harmful stable state, the kind of stable state that would lead someone to seek out some kind of mental health uh, support, at that point, they're in a tough place to shift them out of. It's just a, 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 you know, a phenomenon of dynamical systems that once they have fallen into those stable states, the effort taken to push them out of it is much, much greater than it would be to prevent them from falling into that stable state to begin with. And so I think thinking collaboratively and interdisciplinary in this kind of sandbox way about things that we can do not only to help people when they're really struggling, but how to prevent them from getting to that point in the first place is another really important part of thinking about all of this. I was just thinking how kind of layered all these systems are, because here you're talking about you and Psyche are maybe talking about the biological system of the human being um, and like how that inter is interacting with the environment. And then we have this kind of other layer of the physician patient system or the healthcare provider patient system and how those, uh, how those are producing care and then we kind of back out to Robert's level where we have this entire infrastructuring of a healthcare system uh, that is provisioning care um, and employing people and uh, you know, is, is quite a large organism. I don't know, Robert, Robert, from your level, uh, where, where do you see these kind of uh, potential fertile ground for more 
uh, yeah. more more interaction, more color. I mean, so again, the world I'm in is totally thinking about things at scale, right? And so it's more about how can we provide systems that allow people to do things that benefit patients than, than focusing on sort of individual efforts. But I, I just wanted to address some things that folks said. So Jen was talking about better engagement with clinicians. One of the things that we're sort of blessed at Athena to have is uh, something that we call the Research Council, which basically, you know, we, uh, we basically uh, uh, ask our network of physicians and other users if they are interested in participating with us in uh, developing new products. And so we have a database of over 10,000 clinician billers, you name it, um, that we can, when we're ready to talk with them about anything, uh, they are there to do it. And there, <laughs> there are very few organizations that I've seen that have that, but that's something that we should encourage. Um, and then Stefano was talking about, about uh, uh, care versus cure and about outcomes you mentioned at the very beginning. And I think, you know, something that is something good that is happening in the US healthcare system, not very many things are, but, but one of the things that is good is uh, there is a slow but steady progress towards acceptance of value-based care as, uh, as the paradigm. And we've seen, even over the pandemic, we've seen, uh, we've seen a steady growth in the number of practices that are using that, that have value-based care contracts with their payers. And, uh, and so, that for, so for people who don't know what value-based care is, it's, it's, it's basically, well, the way that the government is, is sort of initiating the regulation is around uh, uh, practices get incentives if they are following protocols for like making sure that, that that the correct sets of vitals and diagnostics and whatever are, are captured from patients on a regular basis, um, you know, so that they are focusing, the idea is that they focus more on the prevention of problems and on care than, than acute care at once things are progressed too far. And so it's in its infancy and, and uptake has been, you know, the usual glacial pace of these things, but uh, but it is it is it is definitely moving along and and momentum is picking up and so one of the things that is on Athena's uh, you know plans for the next several years is to really uh, provide more and more uh, support for practices to engage in value based care both on the clinical side and on the the the, the revenue cycle side um, and then. Uh, and then Donald was talking. Donald's talking about systems thinking, and yeah, of course, I live in that <laughs> in that world. But uh, you know, even within the organization, I spend a lot of time advocating, uh, you know, more collaboration and communication between our different product areas and our different zones, because it's very easy, especially in a big organization, to fall into the same kind of silos that you see in the industry at large, where you know, clinicals doesn't understand the revenue cycle and what impact that has. And so an example of that, I was just talking with a colleague about this, like in the past week, you know, we in, on the revenue cycle side, we collect a huge amount of demographic data about our patients, where, where they, where they live, you know, what, you know, what all of their various social determinants are. But right now that information is not being used to, uh, to inform clinical decision making and social determinants of health are a big thing in clinical decision making, and that information could be fed into clinical decision support systems that you know would highlight uh, areas to focus on uh, that clinicians might not uh, be aware of. And so that's that's just one example. There's a bajillion of these examples. Um, so uh, the other things I wanted to talk about are you know one of the but some of the core collaborations that that we've had with sort of other technology areas are around automation technologies and uh, and around AI and machine learning. And so those two things are huge, and uh, and we are investing a lot uh, in them at Athena. We have a, a big success around recognizing faxed uh, uh, documentation that comes in. We have an AI that can recognize them and put it in the patient's chart correctly. Um, and we're, we're doing similar for things like insurance card recognition and, and, and stuff like that, being able to, to uh, you know, take the load off of the front desk person who has to figure out which of the bajillion insurance plans their insurance card is. And of course, if you get that wrong, 
then it causes a, a you know potential care delays and other problems down the road. So so all of these sort of uh, assistive automation technologies, some of them are simple like robotic process automation where the computer does a bunch of clicking so the user doesn't have to, and then others are more sophisticated like like these pattern recognition ones. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to say is that telemedicine, I think, is, is very much in its infancy right now. Uh, Athena was very quick when the pandemic started to, uh, to, uh, to rather than go with an external uh, uh, solution there to have a fully integrated telemedicine solution that, that really streamlines things and it's been very popular. Um, but that's really just the beginning. We know that patients are not going to the doctor as much as they uh, used to. So, uh, you know, what is the role of technology that we can put in people's homes that can, you know, that, that connect to their patient chart and start, you know, providing information about, you know, their, their weight or their blood pressure or whatever. And again, you know, maybe for healthy people that feels kind of intrusive, but for people with chronic conditions, uh, it could be a lifesaver. Um, so I, I guess I'll leave it there. Well, in that, uh, you know, it really it really shows, I think, the past few years uh, experiencing the global pandemic um, has really shown us how fragile some of these systems are and how much more work there is to be done. Um, I think we're still having trouble with things like uh, families getting baby formula, you know, which I would say is like a kind of adjunct to the healthcare space. Um, uh, and I think hospitals, I was at a patient-centered design conference for physicians just a few weeks ago and I would every physician had the look on their face of uh wow I've just been through something uh, uh, you know so so I think you know all these all these systems kind of depend on the human component of of this uh of this process as well um maybe we can pass the bowl to uh to Leanne sure. uh, <laughs> Try not to have Thank feedback you. from my machine. How's that? I think we're good. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, so much has been said. I, I won't, you know, succinctly uh, build on a, a few of the things. But one, that the theme of collaboration in systems is is really important to me. And also, one one thing that was mentioned was the power importance of language. And I particularly tie that to um, diagnosis because that ends up being the starting point for care. And maybe it shouldn't be. <laughs> there, there, so so um, a lot of what, what we study in our group is autism, which in and of itself, linguistically, is incredibly problematic. Uh, Temple Grandin has a quote, which I couldn't quite find, but talking about the fact that this is a behavioral definition that encompasses individuals who are running large multinational companies in Silicon Valley and people who can't, um, uh, struggle to, to get on the bus and, and do different things for their everyday lives, right? And so how do we, without minimizing the struggle that each person is, is engaged in, how do we actually serve them? I mean, like it really gets to like, what does that mean, that personalization? But it also points out, not to complicate an already incredibly complicated thing, that these massive patient advocacy groups have, have a role. They're already influencing this. The neurodiversity movement is actually challenging what we call autism, is it a disorder? Well, for some people, you know, it is. <laughs> uh, for others, it's a, it's a social, social disability, right? And so we should be thinking more in terms of model disability. There has been, um, many years ago, Tom Insel started the, the RDOC criteria and it stands for Research Domain Criteria. It was instituted in the National Institutes of Mental Health. It actually still exists, although sadly people don't use it. It was an effort to try to move away from the, the very beginnings of this research. We're going to be diagnostic based and instead we're going to be symptom based. I, I study attention and movement. There are a lot of situations where attention and movement cause all kinds of interesting challenges in people's lives, but I, I get to study them if I want a grant in this and in this and in this and, and in doing so I mean you encounter people who have struggled to actually get a diagnosis and I can't underscore this enough in order to get care period can't get there until you actually start there so this is why I think language um, and, and that collaboration are important and the other side of that collaborative point is in training of new people so we 
Um, many of us are at an institution. Um, I'm in the physical therapy department and there is an effort and it's delightful to see, but it's not quite going far enough yet in interprofessional education. Our, our you know, tra newly trained physical therapists need to know what occupational therapists know and how to interact with them. They need to know what speech therapists know and how to interact with them. They need to really be able to engage because it's the best interest of the patient. You know, they, they can't just sit there and say, well, I only do this. <laughs> That's not very useful, right? But we also need in places like, like we are at Northeastern, we need to really be thinking about how do we get the researchers, the people who are actually thinking about patient-centeredness and what it means to be connecting with these clinicians, these future caregivers, right? And so how can we integrate that and expand the way we think about interprofessional education to really you know, take that true systems, you know, wh wh where are you in that node? How can you move people away from the attractors and, and into places where, you know, we could actually be safely monitoring and moving? So a lot, uh, but hopefully in a succinct way. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you, definitely. Um, and, and I think that uh, that question of language uh, being so important when it comes to, uh, just in some of my own work, you know, uh, coaching positive support for patients uh, through from their caregivers and their family members uh, can just that language can have a very can have a clinical outcome where you know I care about you you know and I I, I think you know I'm interested in in what your therapy is and how it's progressing uh, just simple questions like that can have a you know a, 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 a clinical outcome where it fosters better health um, Jason, your your group deals with uh, language, uh, you know, mediated through images and uh, video, all kinds of, you know, okay. semiotic content. Uh, do, do you find this to be the case as well? I think there we go. Before I jump into my answer, I just want to actually take a step back and a deep breath and just say I am just so enjoying this conversation. <laughs> and I think this is uh, loading me up with enough really interesting stuff that I know for sure it's gonna take me at least a little longer to get to sleep tonight because <laughs> my brain's gonna be working so quickly through all of this great stuff that I'm learning. Um, I actually wanna, I wanna put a scenario in everybody's head actually really, really briefly. Just remember the last time you received a diagnosis of some kind. You went to the doctor, maybe it was really bad, maybe it was not terrific, maybe it was confusing, maybe it was frustrating. For me, when I received my last diagnosis, I probably did what you did. I went home, opened up my computer, <laughs> and I started Googling, what is this thing I was just told is going on with me? I think we can all agree, <laughs> this is not an optimal experience. And um, I have been obsessing over this for the last year, this notion that right now, why is it in 2022, we do not have a way to provide really substantial care for people who have just received a diagnosis that understands, um, that anticipates their needs to understand things cognitively to what they might be feeling physically, what they might be feeling mentally, what kinds of supports they should be seeking, where they are within the system, right? Because how, how do they interact with their doctor correctly? How do they interact with their health insurance company correctly? How, those things don't, they don't exist, right? And so I, this is actually shocking to me. This is, it, this feels like when you really think about it, a fundamental thing that we should just have, like this should just be a normal thing that exists. And I think in my profession, we can, we could fall into the trap of saying, well, this is like a learning problem. Like this is a patient learning problem. But in fact, this isn't, this is a, this is a post-disciplinary problem. Right. This is one that demands an understanding of the systems within systems. It demands an understanding of psychology and potential therapies and potential types of patient needs, different, different types of patient contexts. Somebody who lives alone and has no support. Somebody who is 
is older and actually cannot use a phone because, because their hands won't let them, um, or, or somebody who, who has other kinds of challenges. And I, I think, I know, I know, it is possible to create systems that allow people also to understand on their own terms, to be given the space to understand on their own terms, what their own experience is, to reflect on those things and make better decisions based on those things with the right kinds of inputs that helps them be informed in that process. So it's just a modest proposal that I think ties some of the things together that we've been talking about today. It is, it is always tempting the the uh, you know when you're when you're embedded in one of those big systems to kind of push off the responsibility of uh, learning or decision making or therapy adherence to um, uh, to other actors within uh, within this within the system to patients themselves. Um, but uh, you know it, it, I think it becomes very complicated. Um, when we <laughs> the bowl came back, um, uh, I think it becomes very complicated when we uh, uh, when we decide to take that on because it is so complex and nuanced um, and improvisational. Um, maybe uh, uh, any anybody, uh, Jen. Oh my goodness. Uh, let's send that, that down. Okay. I mean, this will be really fast. And Jason's heard me say this before, so I just had to like, but he makes the point, like, you know, he might be wired to think of that diagnostic scenario as a learning challenge. Somebody else who spends their energy on behavior change design might look at it as a behavior change challenge. You know, it's the old hammer nail um, kind of trope, but like, I see that as just all the different lenses. Like if you take a behaviorist lens on that challenge, you'll come up with a behavioral solution, which might get you to the outcome you want, but miss certain other things. So if you take a cognitivist lens to it, you take a different approach, take a constructivist lens is my preference. Like, but I think it's like all of us have these different lenses, like that old toy that you put the, whatever that, what, you know, like how do we just figure out how to put down multiple lenses on every problem we look at as a starting place to, to that, you know, interdisciplinary, post-disciplinary safe space. So I don't know, I guess the other part of that is like, what are all the other lenses? Cause I always think of those three but there's a million others and that's about where I'll be. Yeah. The bowl. From the, the holder <laughs> of the bowl. Uh, I actually have, two, I have like two sides of this forming in my head. One about the systems track of, of, of discussion. Oh, what's that? Just introduce yourself. Oh, I, I'm uh, Greg Dalamole, um, uh, BB of Client Experience and Strategy at MadPal. I work alongside uh, Jen and I'm also a graduate of the MS in Experience Design program here at Northeastern. So I'm excited to be back. Um, so in, in my work, uh, Go yeah, <laughs> uh, in my work with Jen, I think we, we see both the system side of it, and, but I'm also curious as an individual about, uh, you know, very specific interactions. So to pick up on the thread that was just being talked about, I'll save my other systems question for later, but what about encouraging relationships? So it, it came up earlier, with the music therapy description that you gave, which is if it's one person looking at another person, it's kind of easy to see where the center is, right? And I think about, I'll share my own experience briefly. I've never had a relationship with a doctor beyond very kind of a transactional thing in the Western system. I have an acupuncture therapist who we like give gifts to each other. He came to my home when my wife was pregnant. Like that's a relationship. It's, he, he knows me better than most people. So I guess my question to the group is, you know, how does how do organizations encourage that development of the relationship so that 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 really kind of next level of centeredness can come through? It's like all in caps right here, the one that was from cure to care, <laughs> right? Like how do you how do you both incentivize or reward that as a priority in the system? But then again, going back to like. I think a problem in expertise, like we train our medical practitioners and it, it came up at the very early part of the conversation, how someone interprets their, their oath, the Hippocratic oath, you know, if I know that this decision that I might empower the patient to make, I think in my medical expertise judgment is going to be bad for their health. Am I breaking my oath or am I not? Because I'm empowered, you know, that's like, to me, that's like kind of the crux of a lot of this because 
otherwise training slash incentivizing slash, slash allowing self-selection for those providers of care to do that, to build those relationships kind of can't really blossom until that earlier kind of upstream piece gets solved. I just added the question. I didn't answer anything. Sorry. If I may provoke Greg, uh, because I'm, I'm new to Boston. So I was taking a long walk through Longwood and it is the medical area. Mm -hmm. So just to make the example, I think that we have to build again the imaginaries. Because if I search in my memory, places, real places in which this relationship happened, I could find anything. So no place, okay? And I don't know if you, in your imaginary, you could find a place in which there is this open um, and, and without boundary conversational place in which a physician could talk to you. You were making an example at, her, at your home because it, it, was, it was coming to you. But where, the, where this happens in reality? So if I think about the official places in which this exchange could happen, I find nothing. So I think it's also a matter of reforming this imaginary. Because without that, I think that we are talking about a kind of fantasy space in which there is no official roles that could play that, or there is no official, uh, let's say, desire for that. Because I, if I don't see an example, probably I could not uh, uh, train my, my, my intelligence to, to think about it. So again, it's about also materiality. It's not just examples in terms of general performances of things. It's just placing the thing in a real place. Also because again, it's about language. Materiality is better as boundary object than words, in my opinion. So, it allows a more fair interchange. So we have some questions uh, from online. Uh, Dan Daniela, uh, can would you like to unmute well, to uh, ask your question? Hi, hi to all of you. Um, thanks for this debate. Uh, well, I, I don't have any specific questions because I am, I was, listening about all of the things you discussed. Um, I used to work uh, in healthcare as a service designer. So probably I have some bias because um, all the things you expressed and you discussed uh, are very interesting, but uh, I'm inquiring myself uh, uh, if we are now in the right moment uh, to discuss about these things. Because as Robert uh, tell in the beginning, uh, we are facing, we are dealing with a very strong moment in terms of uh, money, economics, uh, and there is a lack to find uh, doctors because, because we are losing a lot of new doctors in Italy and in Europe as well. So um, moreover, I guess designers are more required in another part of healthcare uh, that is the organizational one uh, because uh, it's quite easy for all of us to talk about uh, uh, patient centricity. Come on, we, we come from the human-centric design. So yes, we, we are able to deal with that. Uh, doctors and clinicians, they are also on patient centricity. But at the same time, we are dealing with a, a huge crisis. And in my opinion and in my experience, uh, this is a part uh, of uh, the take care concept and uh, the cure path, uh, we cannot dismiss as designer. We have to be more and more involved in the operation part. Uh, we, um, we are not really recognized as a valuable uh, um, resources in, in some process. So probably to be a service designer in, um, in the management and to be able to influence the decision maker, it could be, um, it could 
make the patient centricness more available and more comprehensible for a lot of people. This is what I'm experiencing now in, in, my, in, my, in my daily job. That's, that's, this is what, uh, and, and that's why I'm shifting my point of view uh, from the quality centricity area and uh, the customer review and customer centricity and so on to a more strategic point of view. Because, okay, I can analyze a lot of data, I can do a lot of interview, I can propose a lot of new projects, I can collaborate with doctors, with clinicians, saving time, saving costs, and so on. But uh, if I'm not able to change uh, the mind of the people that put this money in the project, uh, patient centricity uh, will be still uh, a bit um, weak. Yes, thank you. There's a there's a lot to to unpack there, but, but uh, I I remember like early on in my career, kind of that, uh, you know, the sort of Franklin Covey attitude of uh, the relationship between being able to measure things and manage them. Uh, uh, it's a very you know maybe uh, not uh, not quite as a complicated uh, perspective as we need to solve the problems of today. Uh, Robert. Uh, yeah, I was gonna tie together some stuff that. of healthcare <laughs> the scale of uh, of healthcare uh, you know as a business um in this country is part is partially to blame for for provider burnout right uh you know here in in boston we're in an urban area and we have a very urbanized very industrialized approach to healthcare it's not like that universally we have lots of you know, you know athena many of our practices are small practices in rural places they're not part of big healthcare systems i went uh i, I visited a site in uh in new hampshire recently where for, of where it was a practice of integrated medicine um and uh, and it was in a it was in a beautiful uh, 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 Victorian mansion that, fun fact, was owned by was originally owned by the guy who invented newsreels, <laughs> but uh, at the turn of the century, um, and who the owner of which who was a, who was an RN actually and not a not a not a an MD, but uh, and and all of the practitioners there were were RNs. Um, they and and sort of covered the gamut of integrative medicine. Um, she had she had basically saved that mansion because they were gonna like raise it and build a industrial park on it. And so she actually had it like moved <laughs> across town um, and and it's now now their practice. And you know it was it's a it was a beautiful warm environment and the people there, you know, we saw patients come in and 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 they and it was like what what you were describing where you know these these people, you know, were friends, and there was there was that that emotional connection, and it wasn't just transactional. And so, I think the thing that we need to ask ourselves is, what can we in the in the the um, the service of being patient centered? What can we do that is provider centered that can help providers to you know get if 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 you know that that industrialized system isn't working for them, you know, you know. Uh, it's certainly a movement among providers to move into boutique practices where they have total control of how they interact with, with, uh, with their patients rather than being given, you know, 15 minute wellness slots, yeah. right? Um, so what can we do as designers to enable providers to change how they are approaching their practice uh, so that they they have more opportunities to, to treat patients the way the way providers really actually do want to be treating their patients, but aren't necessarily able to within the confines of the, the system that they're in. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Robert. Robert. Uh, we're, we're, we're running, running right, right uh, to, to the end of our time, time together, together today. today. I think, I think we, we have time just for two more questions. Uh, uh, if we, if uh, uh, Christiane, if we could take the one from online, uh, Christine, 
uh, Christine Zizi has a has a question from online, um, and then we'll uh, go to you for the last question of the day, uh, Christine. Hi, yeah, I'm Christine. Um, I'm coming from the University of Rochester Center for Health and Technology. I'm also Nicole Zizi's sister, so that's kind of how I got the in here. <laughs> um, and I think a lot of the, I have not so much questions, um, but more I think thoughts and observations. Um, and I'm coming from a clinical trial, clinical research background, specifically in some neurodegenerative illnesses. And I think it, the thoughts that have been circling my head throughout these two conversations kind of revolve in two different areas of my work. One is um, developing patient reported outcome measures. And I think really the whole goal of that is to be making sure the patient voice is getting into trials and and that what um, these big companies, these big drug companies are measuring is actually what matters to patients. And I think for a long time, especially in some of these diseases where it can be measured by muscle growth or changes in some other very concrete outcome measures, um, the drug companies and the FDA haven't always said, well, does this actually matter to patients? Because what we found is even if there is some improvement in muscle growth, is it actually improving quality of life? Is this drug really going to be beneficial to the patients? And so I think the FDA has been making a switch in recent years to be making sure that some of the outcome measures are actually more of the patient voice. And so I think that's been some exciting work. Um, but at the same time, it's really hard, especially when you're working with rare diseases, to make sure um, you have the resources and all the different people trying to get those voices in. But I think it's a really cool area and um, is just something I was thinking of as everyone was talking today. And I think there were some mentions of outcome measures. Um, but secondly, I think when, I think it was Jason, um, sorry if I didn't get the name right, but who was talking about diagnoses and really picturing our own experiences of when we're in the doctor's office and we get that diagnosis. And something that I've become more recently involved in is this exploration of palliative care in Parkinson's disease. And traditionally palliative care you tend to think of end of life, you think of hospice care. Um, but what some of the researchers at Rochester are proposing is actually providing this at the onset of a diagnosis. And rather than thinking of just hospice care, but really thinking about how can we provide compassionate care because a disease like Parkinson's and many other neurodegenerative disorders isn't just motor symptoms, it's actually a lot of non-motor symptoms, um, including um, mental illness, grief, spiritual needs, um, caregiver support. And these are things that sometimes the neurologists don't have time to go over in the office. They they give the diagnosis and the patient goes home. Um, and so we've had, and someone else actually mentioned the power of RCTs. Like how can we actually get something done unless we have these RCTs? Cause that's what the NIH, that's what the FDA cares about. And so many of these one-on-one initiatives are hard to prove that. And so we've actually had success with an RCT showing the benefits of introducing palliative care at the onset of a diagnosis in Parkinson's disease. And we saw improvements of patient and caregiver quality of life. And so I don't know if that's the care model for all different illnesses and all different diagnoses, but I think it's just showing that there is there are different methods for becoming more patient-centered and it's just so important. And patient-centered also means caregivers. It also means family members. It, it isn't just... Um, uh, that one interaction in the clinic. Um, and so, yeah, I think it was just interesting to hear all those and see those different connections. So I just wanted to voice some of those thoughts. Thanks so much, Christine. And, and I think, uh, well, I think, you know, you know it, really it really shows, shows a, a lot of value in uh, looking at some of these other, other methods of collecting clinical data, uh, just besides biologic, uh, biologic measure, measures, measures, um, you know, we have patient stories, we have uh, uh, M Health can collect uh, a, a vast range of uh, very um, granular data on a patient's day to day experience uh, that's that's uh, not available in other ways. Um, I don't know if do we have anybody that would like to respond to that? Uh, uh, quick shot, quick thought from Dawn. Should I unmute or should I? I just wanted to say that I just wanted to say that I think the idea of, of looking to palliative care as a place for for gaining ideas about how to take a patient-centered approach is a really nice idea 
and think about it, Greg, uh, yes. Greg's question about how we develop relationships. I think palliative care is one area that does this, this quite well. And there's this notion in, in, I think, psychotherapy broadly, but in palliative care in particular of therapeutic presence, which is listening, which is, is obviously an important part of patient-centeredness, but not just listening, but listening in a way that makes the patient feel understood and seen. And I think that, that that kind of work might kind of help address your question, Greg, of how can we form relationships, even in the short period of time that we have with people that make them feel understood and make them feel like we're seeing their problems. So I think palliative care has a lot of nice examples for us. Should we take the last uh, question from Christian? Thanks, and uh, this has been great. So this has been a fascinating panel. So many interesting things. I'm really grateful uh, for all of you being on the panel and for being able to join it. The only last invention we need for this bowl is popcorn in the bowl. <laughs> I think then we've nailed it. Um, um, it's um, so um, here in this panel and um, and taking back to the title of the panel, uh, if I'm not wrong, disciplinary perspectives of patient-centeredness in healthcare, uh, what's been really interesting for me that's sort of come out in quite a robust way is actually critique uh, towards patient-centeredness as a framework uh, in care. And there's been quite an, an, an open juxtaposition uh, to that in terms of that if we have a systems-based approach, we cannot have a centered-based approach. Um, and that's been, that's been really interesting to me how that's come out also from some of the participants um, via, via Zoom. Um, and it's gotten me think uh, that patient-centeredness in a design context inevitably comes from you know, the human-centered design approach, the user-centered design approach, which was all a, a rebuttal of you know, the late modernist and, and industrial era dominance of the machine and a turning to the human and that, um, but that in the context of healthcare systems, uh, it's been called as myopist, I think by, by Jen, myopist, uh, in terms of that there's so many relationships uh, and that uh, putting the patient center may not be uh, actually um, the way forward to resolve many of these, just because there are so many agents and actors involved in this. In fact, in my own history that over the last year, unfortunately, I see me a lot in context with the healthcare system. Sometimes, many times I had the impression that the issue was that the nurse did not get enough attention in time <laughs> and that that was, uh, was the main issue in the room. Uh, um, um, and so that's been interesting to me, uh, just that it's come out that we talk about patient-centeredness, but perhaps it's time I've seen uh, our uh, incoming colleague, Laura Forlan on the call as well, who's uh, um, spearheaded uh, the debate on decentering the human, perhaps it's time to decenter the patient, even though that sounds uh, paradoxical, but to some extent sort of really um, arriving at a point that the, the systems approach, approach cannot have one center. Uh, and that that's important to consider. That was really interesting how that came out. For me. So that's a question, but I, I, I know we've got a little time. I'd love to engage on that more, yeah. Um, well, oh, well I, I, was, I was just gonna say, you know, sometimes that centeredness can be inadvertently isolating. Right? If you're gonna move uh, everything out to center uh, one, one perspective, one value. Robert, did you wanna? Yeah. I get what you're saying and I agree with it, um, but, but I, I don't think it's an either or, right? I, th I think it's really an and, um, which is we, we can think about the system, but we can always keep ourselves aware that the system exists so that patients can be healthy. And I think as long as we keep that in mind and always ask ourselves, no matter what we're messing with in the system, is it going to make patients less healthy? That, that can keep us honest. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think we're, we're, we're a bit over, over our, our time, time uh, uh, together, together today. today. Uh, thank, thank, thank you, you for, that. for that, uh, that nice closing remark. Um, and, and I'd like to thank all our pan panelists, uh, Psyche, Jan, Stefano, Don, uh, Robert, uh, Miso uh, for sharing our research, uh, Leanne, Paolo, and Jason. And uh, also uh, a big thanks out, out to our uh, team, who's the infrastructure of this event, uh, Nicole and Estefania, uh, uh, couldn't have done it without, without your uh, contributions. Um, thank you all so much. And we look forward to this, uh, this conversation continuing our, our, with our next event. Uh, we hope to engage some patient, organ, patient 
uh, organizations, patient advocacy organizations in, uh, in this same type of conversation. So uh, uh, sign up if you're, if you're not already on our email list, uh, please sign up for that. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll uh, keep you posted of further developments. Uh, thank you all so much. And um, uh, we look forward to the next uh, event.